So, Greg Watts, you are the W from DWB, I take yes. it. Do you yes. want to tell us a little bit about DWB? Yes. Um, well, so it's a long, DWB basically is Paul Drew, is the D, Greg Watts, I'm the W, Pete Berenger is the B, so just simply our surnames. We were uh, writing songs together 2004, 2005-ish, working for another company, and we came out of that company because we we've just thought we were set, set up on our own. Um, you know, how do you name your own company? And it was like, if you've ever ever named a company or a band, it takes you years, everyone can't, can't decide, blah, blah, blah. And the simple thing was, let's just use our initials, DWB. So um, we did that and um, kind of really as a production team, first of all. So DWB was a songwriting and a production team, which then morphed into a publishing team, simply because Paul and Pete were very much hands-on producers, musicians, I um, was more of a top line lyricist and we'd write a song together and then they'd have to finish it, the production and I'd have spare time and I was the salesperson. So, and what happened really, it morphed into publishing as I started to sell the songs. So, so can that, you give us a little idea about what's involved in being a music publisher? What do publishers actually do for writers and artists? Well, um, I would say there's three or four different things that a publisher actually should do. Not, you know, some publishers don't do all of them. Some people do something really well and others. Um, firstly, obviously, you've got to create an environment for your songwriters to write songs. Um, that's setting up sessions, um, co-writes, providing them with leads or briefs to actually write to. Um, secondly, obviously, you do need to sell the songs or pitch the songs to uh, record labels. Um, once that's done and negotiated and you've got a release, then you have to collect the royalties. So kind of a three string row, you know, creation, um, selling and then administration. Um, and there's different sides to the selling and administration. You can be selling songs to artists, selling songs to or licensing songs to um, syncs, TV, film. Um, and it's yeah, all, all of that thrown in together, really. So. And you've had some quite exciting projects in this end. I mean, you're particularly associated with Eurovision, I know, but but also would it be fair to say quite a number of songs in the Far East that have done quite well? I do be kind of was known as the leading um, independent UK publisher in Japan, I believe it was um, a few years ago. Um, we have then been successful in uh, Korea and now sort of starting in China a lot. Um, yes, but also Eurovision, also the DJ world. Of, um, basically, I said we're kind of pop songwriters, and my sales background has always made it well, if we write songs, we need to have a place to sell the songs. And there's no, um, I guess, the European or the UK or the Western market is very much about sitting in a room and writing with the actual artist. That's not easy because, you know, you've got to get past the big songwriters who've already done it before and you know so if you've written a song for Katy Perry then you're much more able to get in the room with another big artist um so we've got to really go where the demand is supply and demand and and actually people who need songs or artists that need songs or groups that need songs Asia is the market because they have a turnover of artists literally looking for songs all the time and they tend not to write their own material which is different to over in the West, where an artist genuinely is involved. There's not many artists, not many groups at the moment in particular, that don't write their own songs, which is different to how it was a few years ago. That, you know, there's, and it tends to go in cycles a little bit. They'll suddenly get a pop market where it's okay to have songwriters and uh, write, songwriters write and artists be artists. But, so. so you've obviously expanded your roster of songwriters out beyond just the original three. So I suppose a really interesting question to ask is, how do you find writers for your roster? Like what attracts you to somebody's writing and how do you know that they're out there? Um, I guess in the olden days, when we first started, it was by, were, by um, kind of our own co-writers co we would then start to publish and then it was word of mouth and then we did things like advertising song link and picked up people outside of that um more so now i think it's because i run songwriting camps quite a lot um 
I'm then looking out into the market about finding songwriters for our people to work with and for people to work with songwriting camps. And as you write, as, as you run those camps, you come across people that some you really want to work with again, some you no, no, no. <laughs> but, and then you, you know, you start to see if that can work. Some of them are published, some of them are unpublished. If they're unpublished, then obviously they, they what tends to happen is they will approach me and say, oh, you know, could you pitch my songs in a sense, because they see that we're doing a good job with our own ones. Yeah. So it's real, and, and obviously the internet now, Facebook, Instagram, um, every time we put a release out, people contact us and sort of yeah. start saying, can we pitch you songs? Because they're, cause they're seeing what we're doing in a sense. So we don't, we used to have to go, that's what I was saying, we used to have to go looking. Now, yeah, don't, no, you don't at all. No, I mean, no, not really. But obviously you then have to filter through yeah. the good and the bad. You know. Is there a good or a bad way to approach you? Because um, I know that, that how you present yourself in an email and that first impression you make can kind of make or break the relationship right at the start so are there some ways of approaching you that are just actually really annoying like I, we chatted a bit earlier before we did this interview about I don't like people to send me wave files that are going to crash my inbox because yeah. people don't appreciate when they're sending me music that you know I'll, other people are sending me music too and my inbox can't cope are there any sort of little annoying things that people shouldn't do when they message yeah. you in, so from my experiences, I've done the other, other side. I've pitched, you know, and I do pitch mm -hmm. songs to, that, to labels. And so I've learnt how to do it. Re really, my approach has always been be nice. Yeah. Be, you know, also ask, is it okay? You know, I'm emailing you, hope you don't, um, I'm a songwriter, etc. Would you mind me submitting songs? And which is your best way to, to do it? You know, do you want to see, receive links, MP3s, blah, blah, blah. I've over the last few years I've continued to say please send mp3s so only just recently I said can you send it to our you know we use this yeah. disc in a sense so whereas others were wanting links a lot more and I used to find links I'd lose you know I, I couldn't yeah. track them in my emails or at least the mp3 I could put it in a folder and listen to it later so but I think if you're courteous and ask that question then I will generally all pretty much always respond um, with I mean obviously sometimes I say now I'm not as busy as I was traveling. I, when I was traveling, it was very hard to respond to every single email at the moment. Yeah. It's probably, yes, you can respond. And I'll usually come back and say, well, give me a bit of time to listen to it and then follow up. So I think there's an element of, and I, I also think now if you approach me and send me some songs, give me some time to listen to them. And I, you know, I will come back. Actually, sometimes if I haven't got busy and I haven't listened, I don't mind if someone says, can you, have you listened to those yet? You know, yeah. so there's an element of, that almost shows you're hungry. Yeah, you're really serious. As long but as you don't do it in a way that's sort of pushy or... There's a fine yeah. line between the two. You know, there's a, I want to show you I'm hungry. I've given you space. So I think I guess it's how I would act. I would send, ask to send a song. Is it okay? Yes. Send the songs. Probably give them two weeks. And then after two weeks, just say, oh, I wondered if you heard my songs. And then let, leave it at that, in a sense. Not keep hassling have you listened have you listened have you listened because I think what people forget is so if I'm going to send a song to Simon Cowell which I was doing a lot at one point is he actually listening to the songs at the other end has he got a secretary has he got A&Rs has he got that he's on the TV he hasn't got time to sit and listen to me hassling 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 but someone at the other end is listening and you know I, I know I built up a lot of contacts by going regularly, maybe once a month, saying, are you looking for songs? Are you looking for songs? Being nice, I get, getting no responses for ages. And then eventually after a year, someone would say, oh, we're looking for songs for this act. And I'll be like, oh, oh, that's interesting. And she's, oh yeah, we've been hearing, you know, and you'd hear the feedback that just because you were always there being nice, eventually that you, you get recognized in that sense. And if you've all, the other thing is also, People seem to have this idea that I want to hear 20 songs all in one go or 10. Oh, and it, you've got to remember that person. So I may get that per day. And if I get it all from one writer, that actually the, it's almost like, I don't know where to start. So there's an element. Yeah, it's of, overwhelming. The key is send me your best song. Maybe, you know, I'll listen to that. And I love your best song. I'll come back and ask you for more. If you send me your best song plus five others, 
I'll be a bit, oh, they're not as good as the... So, so there's yeah. an element of, and that keeps also keeps me hungry and keeps me interested. And I mean, the other thing I'd always say as well is when you send a song, I get a lot of people say, here's, here's some songs. And there's an element of, that's not, what's the reason yeah. for sending the songs? What do you yeah. want me to do with them? What, who are you, you know, there's an element of, I'm a songwriter, here's some songs. It's like, but what's your aim? I always yeah. think, so you're just sending me loads of songs or sending me to you. But what's your actual aim in sending me those songs? You know, what do you expect me to do? Because I can pitch to various places. But, uh, but if someone just sends me some songs out of the blue, there's an element of it. What's your, you know, I always had a vision of what I was doing. If I was going to send someone some songs, I'd done some research of where can I send them. I remember my very first sort of mail out when I was much younger in, in Axe. I and uh, dance acts and things like that and wrote some songs and I remember I got I think I got music week and I got literally every um contact I could out of that and I sent and I spent money copying 250 tapes 250 envelope you know postage packing return post sent them out to everyone and then if you look back and if I'd have done my research I probably you know half of those were distributors they don't want a song but they were in Music Week, so we were, so I wasted lots of time and money by doing that. And obviously nowadays the record companies are much, there's much less of them. There's not two, 250, you know, there's a few. So that little bit of research is probably better. And if that person at the end of the email, you know, if you approach them and say, oh, I've, you, you've done this and blah, blah, I know you're, then they're kind of like, oh, I know why you're looking, you know, why I know why you're contacting me. You've done your research. That makes sense for me to communicate with you. If it's just, sure. here's a load of songs and sometimes I'll get them, you know, here's a load of songs and it's say, I'm, I'm sending you some country market songs, which is nothing wrong with country, but it's not, it's not my no, speciality. Yeah. Or if it's like, here's some heavy metal, it's not much. And you kind of think, so what's the plan? What, you know, what do you want me to do with those? You, you kind of said earlier, you knew that I was involved in K-pop and Eurovision. If someone sends me a song and says, what do you think about this for Eurovision? It's kind of going to get my attention a lot more because I know that people have done their research as well. So basically, I, I just want to reiterate this for anyone who's planning on sending stuff out to publishers. Do your research. Do not send generic emails that you just copy and paste that, you know, give the impression that you know nothing about the person who you're contacting because why should someone get back to you if you don't show that you properly know who they are? I mean, this is a relationships based industry, basically. Yeah. So you, know, you want to communicate in a way that you know, creates a relationship, basically. More about that than, than we know. Everything yeah. I've got going on is because it's a relationship with someone that I've built up over many years. Yeah. yeah. And therefore, every so I'm doing the same. If I'm contacting new people, I'm needing to be the same, you know, kind of. So I do it, say, say with the A&Rs for all the delegations in, in Eurovision to try and get in contact with them. If I just send out a mail out, it doesn't really work. It's like, it's much better to be personal. I think there's, there's a lot of um, people who think that, that there was a lot of music supervisor sites in, a few years ago. You just upload stuff to the internet and they assume that, I can't imagine that most music supervisors are looking in those sites. They, they actually, you know, if you have a thing in your house go wrong with your um, taps, you need a plumber. Do what you do. Do you, do you look through yellow pages for a plumber? Or first thing you really do is ask someone you know, you trust, do you know a plumber? So that's all about relationships in a sense. Okay, after a while, I might go, I can't find a plumber. I'll look on um, the yellow pages. Or you might put on Facebook. Oh, I need a plumber. Has anyone recommended? So it comes from a personal recommendation. It's exactly the same. And I think any business is exactly the same. It's about relationships. I think so. um, it's actually, I always find it's actually quite a small world in songwriting and that people actually do know each other quite well. And um, you had actually mentioned the very interesting factor of songwriting camps, which yeah. are quite a phenomenon in the music industry at the moment and that they bring a lot of writers together who otherwise may not have met. And people divide up into teams and spend their day, maybe from about 10 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, writing and producing a track to quite a good standard just in that one day. So it's a really intense environment, normally three or four days. Yeah. Um, so how did you get into that? And could you describe that what the benefits of that are and how people can get involved in song camps? Yeah. 
how did I get into it first? I, th I think initially, could, because we work over with over a lot of countries over uh, different places overseas, I think it became an idea. I think the first things was we had some Japanese partners and they were wanting to bring some Japanese over to the UK. Um, also, and a lot of people from like Sweden and Norway are also in the same sort of network. So they would come twice a year maybe and do something in the UK with us, something in Sweden with another company. Um, and that kind of started off because then instead of us, us being here and writing songs and the Japanese there and writing songs or us being online and sending stuff, we could all be together. And we found that those, the start of those, that kind of, I don't know, it, it was almost like the cross-cultural thing really worked. We would write much better things being together because we would suddenly understand that's what they mean. Simple things, like I remember our Japanese publisher said very simply, you're writing for girl groups and you keep giving me really great songs, but you have only had one singer on it. And we need, you know, he's talking about girl groups. He said, you need to put more than mums. And that was just one or thing because you were together. And, and this is relationship again. In person, you spent a bit more time with each other than a email backwards and forwards. You spent the three or four days writing. Necessary, but then me as a publisher and him as a publisher sitting there having dinner and lunch and blah, blah, blah. And all the writers are having lunch and you get to know each other more. And suddenly you realise you've moved the business or you've moved the relationship from going swiftly to, wow, we've really cemented it. And then it, afterwards, you saw lots, lots happen. Sometimes lots from the song camp, the actual song camp. So, you know, if we did 24 songs in four days, we tend to find six, six, nine would get cut over a few year, couple of years period and sent um, if it was targeted. Um, yeah. but, all, but probably the key was the relationships you made on that camp yeah. continued. And then because they continued, that developed into new you know new songs new areas and so and you work so if you if you go to a camp and you pick up your best co-writer for the next two or three years that was that's the investment that was the worth thing worth doing so it's almost as well they are effective not not every, i've been on camps which i haven't been effective at all you have to go in and with your own mindset of okay even if i don't get great songs out of this i make relationships um but generally if you go in with the right mindset and the camps run efficiently and there's a goal for it then it can be, I would say, you know, each songwriter should do two songwriting camps a year. And it kind of just, as you go in, you learn from those writers, they learn from you, you pick up new connections. It gives you a drive or some energy for a few months. And then as that's dipping, you know, you do it again, six months. You don't need to do it once, a, once every week because you then never finish the songs. You never have the energy to go back. Yep. The idea is you kind of get the energy from the camp. You go back and put it into your normal life. And then, okay, maybe this dip, I'll go dip in again and I'll get some new people and some new... So you don't need to go to a camp and write with 24 writers and have a relationship with every all 24. You need to go in and pick off the best two or three. Yeah. And then the next time, um, two and three. It can, continues to develop. So. And you do that at the camp, don't you? I mean, you actually sit down and you, you create teams and you say, I think this person will work well with this person. And, and you put people together. Personally, my yeah. planning is, so it's not just the four days on the camp. It's I've spent months planning who I can have at the camp and also then the week before um, doing as much research on who, who's there so I can put them with the right people. Actually, sometimes you don't get that information as much as you need to set up the team. So even on the last night, as people come in, um, I'm kind of interviewing them without them knowing it, kind of getting to know, because <laughs> you have did, and because I remember um, the Les Negres that we were on together, the, most times people come in at about eight o'clock, there's time to sort of have a bit of a session where um, you chat and you get to know each other. And, and I remember, you know, if people have gone to bed, then I don't really know them, you know, because sometimes they've been traveling all day, they want to go to sleep. But I remember one time, come, I don't know if it was your one, people came in at 11, 30, 12 at night on the first night, and it was like, I couldn't get to know them. <laughs> so it was like, so first day is almost you've done the best research you can you you put the people with together also it's an experiment you know and sometimes the best teams you put together don't work as a team that you think won't work for some reason and i don't know why but a lot of the first day you learn and i spend a lot of time going around the rooms and picking up again listening talking to what people are saying because you end up getting the personalities because actually the the 
if you put three songwriters in a room together who fit personality wise and strength wise, they will come out with something yeah. great and new and something different to what they would have done the next day with someone else. If you get personality clashes, that's the, that's, that's the worst problem. And actually it can be two nice people clash. You yes. know, it's just too just, similar or they're too, so it's. Yeah, it's an intense environment, you know, and if people are thrown together, you know, there's the pressure to get the song done by the end of the day, it, you know, and to get it recorded well. And, you know, that, and people are often quite tired because it's physically quite demanding. So sometimes nerves fray, you know, this yeah. can happen. Although I have to say that my experience of it has mostly been that I've actually made some good friends through yes. doing songwriting camps. And I also think that it impacts your craft in a very positive way because you see how other people approach the craft of songwriting and maybe do things differently than you would do it. And then when you go home and you're writing on your own, you, you kind of apply those techniques and see if they work for you. And so it's a way of keeping developing your own craft. But it does mean that co-writing is a more conventional way of writing, especially a commercial pop song at the moment. I mean, um, I imagine that most major releases this year will have multiple writers on them rather than just being written by one person. Would that seems be fair to say? Like, it seems like there's like 19 writers on something at some sort. Yeah. But I don't think that's where there's samples and they've been passed around and things like that. But it, and some, every now and then you see some writers and they've literally written it all themselves. But I think there's something about sharing you know co-writing it doesn't need to be hundreds of people i think two two three four you know but if you're going to sit and write a song on a day and you've got three or four songs three or four days you know you can go in on day one and you can be really inspired and the other one in the room isn't that inspired and this one is you know and you're the one who leads the way and sparks it off and the next day you go in and i think you're not as inspired but someone else is and that sparks you to be inspired so, yeah. so you've never got a situation where you on a camp, I think, where you go in and you're dry because, or even if you are dry, someone else sparks something in you. And I think that's the collaborative process and that's, that's creation in a sense. That's almost all, someone's always got something, you know, and even if you haven't, something they have can spark something into what you do in a sense. So I think that's, that's a key. And also the discipline of having to do a song in the day. I think that does give you discipline. Certainly, we we run a, a camp, a French camp, um, last couple of years, and we always get afterwards. The French writers always come and tell us that they are really impressed with this writing a song in a day, and they always tell us that they've gone back and they actually changed how they work. I think not. I don't know if it's a cultural thing or that. You know, mm -hmm. they're much more laid back about it. But the, and I'm picking out French in particular. You know, in this particular thing because it's from memory. But I think if you've never practiced the doing the song in a day thing, you think it's strange. When yeah. you've done it a few times, you go, oh, it's, it's actually, it's like a muscle. You've built a muscle, you can do it, and we can do it easily now, yeah. in a sense, usually, but not always. Because probably. you have producers there who know their stuff, who are actually quite capable of pulling off a decent standard of production. Yeah. And then if things do need to be polished up afterwards, that can, that can yeah. happen. There's no problem with polishing up later and all that sort of business. My thing on the camp is get get song written, vocals recorded, and then you go away and you've got something in your hands. Like, okay, we've got, okay, maybe it's not completely finished, but you've got something where you can go, okay, we can do this with that. The mistake is coming out when you haven't got anything re recorded. And it's um, because those songs disappear and, you know, and then someone's on to another camp. Or they, as soon as you, the point is, I think, as soon as you've left the camp, you're back to your normal life or you're back to what you, your other work or you're back to this. So you haven't got the top focus time. And I think that's again, a key to the camps and the key to the first one that happened in Japan and that then oh, happened here with the Japanese. And then it went on to Eurovision camps. And you have focused time with a group of people that are like-minded and trying to do the same thing. Therefore you get some amazing stuff out that you wouldn't necessarily without that mix. Yeah. And you may never have, you know, Las Negras, for instance, remember the first one, brilliant. The second one, you think it's going to all be the same. Some of the same people came and some new people came. And as soon as it's a slightly different mix, it's totally different. It was, a, yeah. it was good in a different way, you know. And, it's, and what I didn't really want was, and so we had one camp. I remember the second camp, I said to people, said to the other, other organisers, the second one, 
quite a few of the same people came back and that's good. But what I don't want it to be is to become a club. Because yes, as as, it will, yes, exactly. Then, you, then those people talk to each other and the new people don't feel like they can integrate. So the third camp, we actually changed into three and four. And we said, let's do two camps and we'll split up the ones that may have becoming too knowing each other, you know, and put them, not all of them, but some put them in different camps because then, and actually I think they would value that because they got a new experience of, instead of it becoming a club and just, okay, it becomes a bit like a holiday and we're nice and we're just, in, and you talk about the last ones, actually going forward, you get new relationships. It's like, ah, this is good. We, you know, we're building every time in a sense. So, so if I know that people can apply for the Last Negros Camps, I, is it lastnegroscamps.com? Am I getting that right? I'll, I'll make sure that I get that yes. you know, properly spelled out. So you can apply via the website, yeah. but I imagine that not everybody who applies is actually selected to attend. So what are you really looking for? So that marks someone out as having potential? So the one that I run is more about mm -hmm. um, professional songwriters. Yeah. Um, we do expect, accept some sort of ones that are co coming up um, because I, again, I've run camps where I've had absolutely the best people on and they've not actually always been as good as the best people mixed with the aspiring. There's a, there's a little bit of energy and not all people believe that, but I do. And I know several people, producers that I've worked with do that. Sometimes you get energy from people who've and hunger from people who are nearly there instead of people, you know, whereas people that are totally there already haven't always got that. So you've got to mix, you've got to mix it up keep and keep it fresh so i guess you know if you've got things that are happening if you've if you've got good songs already and you can show that that you're a good you know good songwriter then we'd, we'd look at it and discuss that we can get people in we often have a student in from you know a student school because i know i've met some at certain schools and gone for this they're good I'll, we'll let them come and we've genuinely found that that is a good thing it brings some sort of nice life to the camp and going forward you've got okay, why that those ones, which you may have on paper gone, oh, we shouldn't accept these because they haven't had massive hits yet, were actually some of the best writers on the camp or produced oh, the best. I wrote with one girl in Las Negras who was, um, I'm going to be honest, I have socks that were older than this girl. And she was a student and she had the most phenomenal voice, phenomenal voice. And yeah. the song that we came out with, there was three of us actually, and brilliant producer and he already had some tracks done and basically we spent the day top lining but you know with a good producer and this amazing powerhouse vocal um it was just great if you don't have a huge back catalogue out there and something to beat you know like you're not trying to beat your last song yeah. you know like that in a way there was a bit of freedom to just do what felt right for the song and not go in any sort of predetermined direction or but there's an element as well where we mustn't forget. So I'm in my 40s. I've been, you know, grown up on certain music. I know what I like. And I've, as a songwriter, if I sit, if someone gives me, you know, can I, at the moment we're getting briefs for like um, Joji and things like that. Okay, so give me a song like that. Can I do that on my own? I don't think so, because it's not what I listen to. Me but neither. Yet, yeah. But I can, I can work with someone else and I can impart my experience of melodies and therefore I need younger people in the mix, younger people who are listening to that, who will write a different type of melody to how I would. And they need me or an older producer or this to actually develop that and make it, you know, that's really good, but it's, we need some extra hook, you know, that sort of thing. And we all need each other in that way. There's no, if we put three experienced 40, people in their forties <laughs> in a room together, we'd probably come up with a sound that actually is a certain sound of that era or all of yeah. our influences from that era. Would that be sellable at the moment? Probably no. What we need is to have some of those young people in the mix where yes, they're learning from us, but we're kind of still learning from, you know, I, my, oh, yeah. my 10 year old twins and they're on TikTok all the time at the moment doing dancing and things like that. And it's interesting listening to what they're listening to and watching yep. what they're listening to and thinking is that if that's what's now you know you have to indulge i get a could get a and i have done a brilliant song come in and it's just like but it's 1997 or something yeah. 
how do I sell that song? And I'll get, if I go, this is another thing, you go back to the writer and say, yeah, this is great, but oh, can you just send it in? And they'll still say, can you just send it to wherever you want? It's like, but no, we have to get the production right. Because if I send a song to someone who thinks it's from 1997, it just makes me look stupid because they think, well, why have you presented it? As, you know, so presentation is just as much as important as the song we do ourselves. And if people are going to pitch music to you, would you recommend that it be pretty much produced to the highest standard that they can afford to get it? Or are you happy to be sent demos of things? Um, this is one of the things of explaining how that if they're going to send a demo, yeah. they need, you know, or a, they need to know, almost say, this is a demo. You know, I understand it might need to be produced differently. Have you got any advice on how to produce it? Yes. That's, that's different to here's a finished song, can you pitch it? So that's yeah. the explain. I would say, see, I'm someone who can hear f through production because I'm a songwriter and a producer as well as a publisher. Um, I know a few A&R people, publishers, who can do that. I think it's harder and harder these days for people to do that because everything is so production-led. Yeah. Um, so I would say to just send a song that isn't produced somewhere is dangerous in, Absolutely. In, you need you need someone as i say I, if i get that in a sense it's fine as long as there's an explanation and I, I i know that part of my publishing role is to develop songs and to say well this is what i would do um but it's to a label you kind of if you probably go well what, what it's in the olden days you could do that you know in nashville you could do that but in because everyone's tuned in to hearing this is a song and I had to imagine how to do it. And I remember getting a few cuts with songs that were, they were basically piano or acoustic guitar with a great vocal. So it was a really good recording. And we did get a couple of songs. And I remember the, actually both with the same producer, that was one with a Jennifer Rush and one with someone else he did. But it was, um, he could hear, this is a great song and I don't want it presented to too much because I can produce it myself but most producers most record labels aren't run by producers there you know it's so nowadays we do pitch songs like that if there's a good piano or good acoustic guitar with a good vocal to DJs because DJs like to produce things around but other than that I'd say the production need to be like the act yeah. that you're sending it for and that's not easy because that costs money to get it like that. that. That's the basic problem, isn't it? Um, although, as you would not go to a job interview wearing jeans and a stained T-shirt, you are, in essence, pitching yourself with this track you're sending. So if people can't afford to go into a studio and have something produced to sort of completely broadcast standard, mm. um, is there another way around that? Can they even send some music to a producer to, to like remix what they've recorded themselves or, you know, is, yeah, is there a way? I think that, again, you used to be able to do that and you used to be able to say, can you get on your, you know, can you co-write this with me? And, and it's all about levels. You're never going to get the top producer to mm -hmm. say, yes, I'll produce your song for nothing or, you know, for a co-write because this person's really busy doing their own thing and why do they want to help you to come in? And I think, um, so that's getting harder and harder and harder. And I think especially now that there's less money in writing and production and with this situation going on in the world. Oh, yes. Everyone's kind of thinking a bit more for themselves, I guess. There's an, there's an element in how, how can we all survive. So it's harder and harder. <laughs> I mean, I would, I've always said to people, get one song. Yeah. Really well produced. Aim that, you know, even if it's, you don't have to have a hundred songs produced like that. That is becomes your calling card and then set, shop that song. Yeah. Um, you get some, you know, so it's the same as going on. You could go on every song writing camp in the, the year and you just spent, you know, tens of thousands of pounds doing that. Is that really sensible or is it sensible? That, you know, you learn, do your research and you pick, that's the best camp I know of. I'll go on that one and I'll make that really work. I'll spend all my energy and time on that. And then, develop relationships after that and I think that's another key of as you said how can you get them built up 
lot of, so so for for instance i when i first started so i can play keyboards and i was a singer and um and I'm, i got my own recording equipment when i was i well, first of all I, I didn't do music at school and i but i managed to convince my music teacher of the school can i come in and use the recording studio and i made a little version of strawberry fields Aww. for the christmas show hour hour a day sorry hour a week for about six weeks big mistake picking strawberry fields if you're not the the most musical person because there's lots of key um, time signature changes and, and I remember him sitting there thinking what's Greg do um, but anyways so I made that happen I got got alongside someone who'd got some equipment I then invested in my own equipment learned how to produce a little bit myself when it came down to it properly I had to find people who were better than me at production and partner so my hence the two partners I have they complement what I do. Paul is a brilliant producer and guitarist and engineer, got an amazing ear. Pete is a genius producer and songwriter, um, comes up with a, you know, four ideas a day. And I kind of was in the middle of them and, you know, and they were able to, we let's write songs together and then they produce it, you know, and I might sort of suggest things, but they're hands on produce, producing it. Um, but I couldn't have got, got where I am without them. In that sense, yeah. and I think the same the same way around. They wouldn't be where they are without in, me, in a sense. So it is about finding that collaboration, and that's yeah, where it's I'm the still... relationship thing again, isn't it? That that no one's an island. I mean, because right. no one has the whole set of skills that you need to succeed in, in songwriting and publishing. Like you can't be a writer, a producer, a promoter, and know about marketing. No, and I think whenever like, you one think... person is going to do everything. When you think you can do that, that's the mistake. I mean, someone like Prince is a multi-instrumentalist and he's really well, blah, blah, and that, but he's a one-off. But he then, was he a publisher? Was he this? Was he that? And probably not. So, so that's, it goes back to that thing of, okay, so a songwriting camp may be a better investment because when you go on a songwriting camp, you might meet 20 other people and you could meet your partner who you write with for the next few yeah. years. So if you're, and I know there's a lot of lyricists or melody writers, so you can continue to pay producers to do things or get on that and find some, you know, let's make a team. Because yeah. you have to remember, but it obviously has to be at the same sort of level to build up or someone who's just a bit ahead rather than trying to get someone who's up here who's already yeah. sitting with you because they're, they're not going to be quite so interested in just working with someone who's starting off. So, so I guess it's steps, you know. Yeah. Lots of, you know, I didn't, and I'm not, I'm not, made it or anything but you know i've got made a longer journey i've made a f different steps and i think in the days I, I remember you know i used to send songs in to big people and expect you know why aren't they answering me you know and now you realize the, pr the process is well why would they answer or why would they i mean we had some holds with some big labels um and we later found out that 400 songs are on hold um and really they were just taking songs on hold but really what they were asked, you know, they were going to the name writers and if they didn't do it, they might take one of those songs from, from an unknown person. But if you think about an A&R, their job's on the line. If they take a song yeah. from Rick Watts, who's completely unknown, even if it's a brilliant song, and then that song flops, well, who are they going to blame? They're going to say, well, Greg Watts is, you know, he's unknown, but, but the A&R, you knew it was unknown. Okay, so why don't we pick Ryan Tedder's song instead? Because if we pick Ryan Tedder's song, and it flops. Well, it was Ryan Tedder. You know, of course it was. So there is an element of, of course you use the person who's an expert rather than yeah. the person who's coming up. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, I do think when people are starting out that um, I've had some students who would send stuff at a fairly early stages of their careers, like major labels. And for a start, you can't send stuff to major labels. They usually don't accept unsolicited material. But when you're climbing a ladder, as you say, at steps, you have to go rung by rung. You can't just suddenly aim for the very top of the ladder overnight. You know, the, the X factor in some of these TV shows, of course, we, we've worked with people who've been on those shows and they have a, a lot to offer, but maybe sometimes give the impression that you could be singing into a hairbrush one day and be, be, like, be capable of a million pound record contract only yeah. a few months down the line. But like real life really doesn't work like that. It's about steps and stages and progression. Yeah, and I think we, that's yeah. the problem. TV shows it that it is, so that's what we believe. And and I, and I, I mean, I'm of two. 
I remember my granddad telling me as a boy, you know, reach for the moon, you might catch a star on the way down. And I kind of have that philosophy. So the aiming high is important and having a goal. Mm. But along with that, being realistic as you go along, and I think there's another a guy that I know, songwriter friend, Leo Schentzer-Saras, um, who's now a and r at Universal in Germany, and we used to write songs together. And one of the things he always says is, you know, you don't get the same opportunity more than, you know, it doesn't kind of don't give, take the opportunity at the point where you're not ready for the opportunity. If that kind of makes sense, you know, here's my demo for the top artist in the world, but my demo is not good enough. You've got, you might not get that chance again. There's no kind of got to be cleverer about it and think, am I ready? Not that I don't believe in myself because you, yes, you do believe in myself, but is that a and R because you could, you know, you know, we've all got kind of friends in places. If that makes sense. There's someone who I can use, you know, I know someone who can get me a song to this really by person, but have I got the right song? Should I wait until I've got the right song? When I've got the right song and I deliver it to the right person and they're like, oh, this person, you know, there's an element of use the opportunities wisely, I guess, rather than kill the opportunity and they think, oh, that person's not good enough, don't come back again. I would kind of add to that just that it's very important to keep getting feedback because it's very hard to assess when you're starting out, if you've only been writing for a few years, what kind of level you're at and you know where your songs are at without ever getting the input of someone from the industry who can say, well, you need to work on your hooks, you need to work on your production. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you need someone with experienced ears to actually give you some input before you start pitching to artists and for sync, really, you know, run it past someone who knows what they're talking about, I think is yeah. generally a good idea. Yeah. I think, yeah. Feedback is good in general. And as long as it's the right person giving you feedback, yeah. because some people give it, do give it for the wrong motive and some people, you know, can, but again, if you're on a, if you're on a camp, for instance, you can build relationships with people who you then trust and you can say, what well, would you listen to this for me and tell me your, and they have that their input could be value, valuable, yeah. but it could be that, again, maybe they're a little bit along the journey further ahead than you. And they can open it, you know, their input can help. But you, as you know, you'll go in, as you said about the, that, that writing, you go into those camps and you learn something from something. It doesn't mean you do it, oh, this person does it like this, I must go back and completely do it like they do. Mm -hmm. But they've got a good idea that you can, oh, I can use that at home. And, and, it has, and you don't probably... That person may be sitting there thinking the same. Well, I've never done it like that. I may take something. <laughs> so it's a collaborative process, and I think because you tend to sit with people and have dinner, and sit with people and have lunch, and get to know them a bit more, you have that opportunity to share a bit more yeah. intimate. In in the sense of, here's my, I trust you. I'll send you my song to listen to, and they'll give you proper proper feedback. Yeah. So there's, I, I think there's more to those than. And maybe those are the step camps are kind of the stepping stones between how you can get different places. I, I was, I've certainly seen the Las Vegas, for instance, where people have come in and then they've worked a lot with. Um, I haven't mentioned a guy called Johnny Palmer. I don't know if you did you meet Johnny on your camp? I don't think I did. No, I think he was there in the camp just before me. So we kind of. He's from Hungary, um, or he works a lot in Hungary, and you know people have gone written with him and then after the camp they've written with him again but suddenly been successful in Hungary if, if they hadn't have had you know there's no way they would have had that success in Hungary without meeting Johnny yeah because they how do you get into the Hungarian music business and vice versa with you know certain places countries coming people from different countries coming in it opens a door to that territory I mean we've been quite successful in Poland over the last few years and yeah Partly, I can't remember why it started, but I think it was we went on a Polish camp. Was that the first thing? And automatically, you met loads of Polish people, you wrote with loads of Polish people, and then things things connected and you clicked and bang. You know, without that, I wouldn't be, wouldn't have been successful there because yeah. you're almost like lobbing a brick. You know, here's my stuff from outside, yeah. and actually, without I mean, this is I've, we learned this technique from the Japanese going to Japan because the moment we went to Japan we understood a cultural difference and there's more to writing songs for a different bands in a different country than you think. And it's partly to do with culture and partly to do with how they do business in that culture. And same, and, and this is the same as with Eurovision as well. 
whenever I have an artist or a, a song writer that gets to a, like a national final for Eurovision, I will take them and say, let's go and watch the final. Because there's an understanding of once you're there, same as you get to Japan, you walk around Shibuya and you suddenly think, wow, look at this music industry that's still alive. There's still a CD shop. There's still a record. Yeah. That, there's still girls generation bus flying around you know there's still this stuff going on and you kind of go oh, okay i get it and the same with eurovision you get there and you go i get how big this is i get why we would do this yeah. i get then you come back and you find those people learn how to do it so there's a there's a thing about going somewhere as, as well and learning yeah. a little bit about culture or a little bit about something from that country yeah. that, and getting slightly outside of your own box into these new territories. Well, Greg, thank you so much for your really useful insights today. I think what I'm taking out of what you said is the importance of relationships, really, um, and production. That's the biggest. Yeah, the the production is important, but I think the relationship crosses everything. Everything we've talked about, that is, it's all about, if you don't have the relationship, it won't happen, really, so. Well, thank you so much. Um, And if anybody who's watching this video wants to email you, is that okay? As long as they don't all start overloading your inbox? Yes, that's fine. I can post the link to DWB in the description Yes. with this video and to the Las Negras song camps as well. Yeah. yeah which true. I can personally recommend because I have been. The music is great, the people are great, and the food is great. And there's also a beach, there's so a beach. there's nothing to- And we want to go to the beach together in the end. <laughs> but we went stargazing. Remember, yeah. we, we have to wish, and I'll tell you this little story, you have to pick a, a star and tell it something that you really wished for but I accidentally wished on an aeroplane I did. suddenly realized the star was moving yeah. do, you, do you remember do you remember that night if you think about that night and we were all having our our dreams you know Doran who'd written the Eurovision winning song for Israel mentioned that um, he used to go to the beach and dream and um he kind of said to us to go around the beach and I don't know offer up our dreams Interesting that that's the camp that Cleopatra from Azerbaijan's Eurovision was written on. So I wonder. That what was-, was a great song. I, I actually felt really disappointed that, that um, in the show that they did in the UK, you didn't get to hear the whole of it. But then this year was just really unusual circumstances, but it really was a great song. So I'll post a link to that song as well so that people can go and listen to it. Came from, dreams come from dreams in a sense, in that sense as well. So. Mm-hmm. So well done on, you know, the success of that song and other songs. And thank you once again. That's all right. Good to speak to you all.